Our very last speaker for today is a wonderful comedian who sometimes affectionately is referred to as the Reverend Nuge. Tommy Nugent is easily North America's favorite preacher turned gambler turned law school dropout turned street mu uh, magician turned comedic cult leader. Tonight, Tommy will be performing his stand-up routine, Preacher Man, which tells the story of how he went from being a faithful youth minister to working as an atheist comedian. One last warm Free Thought Festival round of applause for Tommy Nugent. Imagine myself speaking in front of 500 or 1,000 teenagers and, and making them laugh and making them cry and seeing the move of God as a messenger of God go through me. And I felt the call to full-time ministry. And I followed Pastor Tim's footsteps to his Bible college, North Central Bible College in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a proud alma mater of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. So that was a good thing. Now I go to this Bible college. Now imagine 1,000 students who we all felt this call to ministry, right? So this is however devout most people you might know would be. This is the devout of the devout of the devout. And we're in this Bible college, and, and it was, I mean, it was a subculture, and it was weird, but I fit into it at that point in my life. And matter of fact, I didn't think the college was quite holy enough. Now here was the Bible college. We were required to go to church, so I went three times a week, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. We had daily mandatory chapel services, which were full-on Pentecostal church services every day um, from 9 to 10.30 in our academic day. Um, we weren't allowed to, uh, you know, obviously drugs, drinking, uh, sex was grounds for expulsion if you were single. Um, I didn't personally, I didn't have a TV, I didn't go to the movies, I didn't listen to any non-Christian music. Safe to say my college experience is a little bit different than yours? Okay, all right. So I found a group, though, that we didn't think we were getting enough God time. So we joined together as a special little holiness enclave in the midst of all the other Bible college students. And we would help each other, you know, maintain accountability. Um, you know, because not only is premarital sex wrong, well, masturbation is a giving in to the lust of the flesh. So you don't want to do that either. So, you know, we would, like, have a, a accountability partners amongst ourselves. And, like, you know, how you doing, brother? I'm at day 29 without and I'm on back to two <laughs> so this group decided the chapel services and the church wasn't enough so we started our own Friday night church service and while the less spiritual kids were at the basketball game we were in the college life center room 103 having our own church service and what would happen one of us would get up and lead praise and worship for like an hour with the guitar and you know we would sing and cry and praise to God and then one of us would get up we'd take turns would preach a full service sermon, and now we're practicing our homiletics, or our preaching classes, and um, I'm going to ruin sermons for you, right? <laughs> Look where I'm talking. I guess they're already ruined for you. <laughs> But here's, if next time you go to church, um, listen for kind of the structure that's real common, right? So a three-point sermon you'll hear a lot. It's a three-point sermon. So it starts with an introduction, and usually it's a story or a joke or something that will kind of rope the audience in. And then one, two, three points. Each point typically has explanation, illustration, application. Then at the end, there's the conclusion, which is the call to service, usually an altar call of some forward, come take an action for God in some sense. So the funny thing about Pentecost, churches we love to preach and we would have these preachers come to chapel services and Pentecostals get up there and they're like preaching and I know that I know that I know in five minutes ten minutes 15 minutes a half hour 45 minutes and dudes wiping his brow and after an hour he's all and this concludes my introduction point one you're like ah oh, Jesus <laughs> But we wanted as much Jesus as we could get. So we're preaching to each other. There's like a half, no, there's maybe a dozen of us at our peak, this little holiness group we had. One night at the Friday night church service amongst ourselves, um, after the sermon, we would have altar time where maybe we would pray by ourselves or pray for each other. And I'm off by myself. I'm kind of snuggling in with Jesus, just kneeling down praying, and everyone else is doing their own thing. And my friend Rob taps me on the shoulder and says, Hey, Tom, uh, give us a hand. We're casting demons out of Pam. <laughs> okay. As I tell this story all these years later, it weirds me out a little bit, I'll admit, right? <laughs> but I'm not weirded out that I was involved in an exorcism at 19 years old. I'm weirded out looking back that I didn't think it was a big deal at the time. 
<laughs> and I, you know, I was like, oh, casting demons out of a classmate. It must be Friday. And I'm not the only one, because we're in there having this racket, and it's, it's everything you would think it would be, right? I mean, it's worse than it, it looked like an assault as much as uh, an exorcism, because Pam is, is kicking and writhing and spinning spitting and swearing and we had two guys like holding her down by the shoulders and another guy's got his hand on her head and, and speaking to the demons and guys walking around reading Bible verses but my God shall supply all of your needs according to Christ Jesus and no power is taking you but such as is common to man and demon I command you in the name of Jesus get out and she's all oh you'll never get her back <laughs> A student security guard hears the racket. A student security guard comes into College Life Center room 103 and looks and goes, oh. oh, you guys are casting demons out. Turn off the lights when you're done. I swear to the God I no longer believe in, that is an absolutely true story. It was a subculture, but I felt very at home within it because I thought I was not only called to be a minister, but I thought I had this big call on my life, that I was going to be like the 20th century Apostle Paul, that I would be called to move into inner cities in America and start a youth group, and then the kids would become the pastor and take over the church, and then I would go to the next church and keep in touch with them like I, Paul had done. And I really would go back and forth during Bible college between these delusions of God grandeur and this crippling self out, where I would think, man, I'm called to be this amazing man of God, but I'm going to blow it. I'm going to have some sin in my life that's going to destroy it. And I would go back and forth. And my senior year, I actually wrapped up a couple uh, classes early, didn't quite finish them because I was offered a position to move into southwest Detroit. Uh, two other guys and myself would start a brand new church called Metropolitan Outreach Center, and I would be the youth pastor. I would be in charge of everyone like 11 to 18. Um, I was their mentor and their pastor and, you know, the closest thing a lot of them ever had to a father. We would get invited because people were hearing about this move of God that was happening with my youth in Detroit and invited to speak and travel around Michigan and um, I'd bring my youth choir with me. We had the weird stuff happen sometimes. You know, someone would come up to get prayed for and I would touch their face and they'd fall to the ground. I'm like, I have super Jesus powers. <laughs> but I didn't really care about the traveling around. I just, I wanted to be with my kids. And some of the times we would travel and the suburban churches would be like, oh, you know, you're, the way you've given up your life for these kids, that's amazing. But I didn't feel like I was giving up my life. I mean, these kids were fulfilling my life. They were becoming my life. You know, at 21 years old, I had found where I was going to be and what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And I know some of you have heard these, these type of monologues and stories before. Um, and, you know, like this guy right here, he's looking at me like, oh, this is probably where he's going to throw in some tragic melodramatic plot twist. And I got to tell you, sir, you're right. And it occurred to me that I didn't feel God anymore. And I'm walking along the beach, and I realize that whatever experience I had had of God, I could come up with an alternate explanation. That the worship and the praise were just emotional reactions, and the swell of music, and that the sense of community that, that tied me to this organization, and now all that was taken away, and the community was gone, and everything was gone, and I had this extreme depression that I can't shake, so I don't feel God anymore. And I had, for the first time ever, just the thought, is it possible it was all bullshit? And just with that, is it even possible? It was like the first tug on that thread that would eventually unravel the whole sweat. Less than a year after being a Pentecostal youth minister, I was a bartender in a strip club in Las Vegas. <laughs> I told you, slingshot. This is the applause I get. Right, okay, lovely, lovely. Sure. I was saving lives in the inner city 10 minutes ago. You weren't clapping then. <laughs> Heathens. So I'm in Vegas doing my thing, and then it began this series of ups and downs. It was like, yeah, Vegas, I'm on my own, and I quit the, the strip club out there, and I was playing cards professionally, and it was like, sweet. And then I lost everything, and I was like, not so sweet. But then I got accepted to law school, and I went to law school, and then I washed out a month later. And then I got a job, and I was fired from it. And then I got another job, and I was fired from it. I'm bouncing up and down and up and down. And I didn't have a mentor, no more Pastor Tim in my life. Um, so I had a new pastor. Pastor 
Tony Robbins. Anthony Robbins, I saw, <laughs> he's not a real pastor. I saw a late night infomercial with his motivational speaking thing. And he said, um, you know, if you don't know what to do in a career, make two lists. And this is good for some of you who maybe don't know kind of your path yet. Um, so make two lists. The first is everything that you would want out of a career. Don't censor yourself. Just write it down. Anything that comes to mind. So, all right, I want to make a difference. All the other things that I had tried, it was not the same as working with kids in Detroit. So number one, I want to make a difference. I don't want anyone to tell me when that difference is making is over, so I wrote to be my own boss. And I'd like to make a difference for more than the $700 a month I was making as a pastor, so I put to make a good living, to travel, and the needy one, I put applause. It's a good thing I didn't go into accounting expecting, yeah, Tom, great debit column. I made this list. The second one was everything you're good at. It was a shorter list. <laughs> I'm good at working with teenagers. I'm pretty good in front of a crowd. And at the time, I was an amateur magician. I'm like, I can do magic tricks. I can speak to teenagers. I'm okay on stage, and I can do magic tricks. That is a narrow-ass skill set to try and build a life around. But it kind of clicked one day. I knew a sales call that I, on a sales job I hated, and I thought of those youth evangelists I knew back in the day. A lot of them, their day job was doing school assembly shows, you know, the anti-drug stuff or anti-bullying stuff. So I thought maybe I could do that. And I put together this thing, magic and motivation, right? So basically, I combined the world's two cheesiest professions. You know, I'm like Anthony Robbins and David Copperfield's secret love child. So... <laughs> I combined these things and I launched this business and it took off like crazy. My first contract was $4,000 for four days worth of work. I'm like, I'm in. And I'm all of a sudden now traveling all around the country and I have this vision came true of me speaking to 500 and 1,000 teens and them laughing and crying. And my high school reunion, the same group that didn't want much to do with me back in the day, they hired me to speak and perform. And um, during my performance, I had invited my girlfriend at the time up on stage, and I magically made a ring appear, and I got down on one knee, and that's where I proposed. And <laughs> thank God she said yes. That would have sucked. Um, <laughs> and now looking back now, I, the phrase attention whore leaps to mind. But at the time, I thought it was kind of sweet. And she, she did say yes. We got married. And she's very patient with my attention whore needs. And she's also patient of the idea I had the summer before we got married. I thought I was going to travel the country as a street magician, living and traveling on whatever I can make doing tr uh, <laughs> turning tricks for tips. So anyway, um, <laughs> making, doing street magic, collecting money. The only thing on my schedule that I knew I wanted to hit on this, because I was going to call it Magic Across America and write a book about it, right? And the only thing I knew for sure I thought I could get some interesting stories out of was this thing happened in the Nevada desert called Burning Man. So I figured this was worth a story or two. If you don't know, an eight-day fest festival in the, the Black Rock Desert in northern Nevada, um, described as an eight-day experiment in temporary community based on radical self-expression, radical self-reliance, and a leave-no-trace environmental philosophy, right? Radical self-reliance, because there's no vending allowed. You bring in whatever you need to survive in very harsh elements in the desert. Radical self-expression, uh, because kind of anything goes. And then, you know, take anything you bring in, take it back out so you don't leave anything and hurt the planet. So I go down there and I'm a little bit disappointed because I thought it was going to be more remote. And I'm driving down the mountains and I see it next to this uh, small town. But then as I got closer, I realized that was the festival. 30, this is, it's doubled since then, but back then, 30,000 people uh, showed up in this desert just to do their own thing. And the 30-foot statue of the wooden man, the burning man, is set on fire on the final Saturday of the, the thing. I go down there, and one of the first things I see, um, there's a, a woman walking around, attractive young woman, and, and she's walking around topless um, with a can of cheese whiz. And she's putting cheese whiz on her nipples and letting people lick it off. It's her way of saying good day, I guess. And I watch one guy partake of one nipple, and I watch another guy partake of another nipple. I have a little bit of a germ thing. I mean, it's not crazy, but enough, right? And, and I'm looking at the cheesy saliva, dusty nipples, and our eyes meet. And we look at each other, and she doesn't offer, and I don't ask. To this day, it remains the most beautiful, awkward moment I've ever had in my life. <laughs> but it was one of many awkward moments to follow. Because I have this chronic um, reoccurring condition uh, called social retardation. It's mostly under control, but it does flare up sometimes. So whatever the reason, like a lot of performers, I feel kind of unnaturally natural on stage. It's the other 23 hours of the day that screw me up. So sometimes I just lock down and I cannot talk to human beings. You may see me disappear at various times throughout the conference. You'll know what's going on if I'm like in a corner and then I'm gone. 
So I am walking around the desert and I couldn't talk to anybody. For three days, I am just walking around. Now, I didn't bring enough food. I'm, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm too cold at night. I'm too hot during the day. I can't talk to anybody. I'm walking around. This is great. Magic across America. Why don't you write your next book and call it Socially Retarded Every Damn Place You Go. And I'm walking around just hating being there. Then on the fourth day, two guys kind of recognized my aloneness and they invited me to hang out with them. And just like that, social connection flipped the script for me. And these guys were outgoing, and uh, Sean was a struggling actor from L.A., and his lifelong best friend Dave was a, a not-so-struggling marijuana grower from Central California. <laughs> and they were outgoing, and you know, Dave was, he had a way to make friends in Burning Man. <laughs> so we're, I'm like kind of following them now. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going party to party, and I'm hanging out with them, and I am having the best time. There's art camps and theme camps and amazing art projects and performance stages built and all kinds of art vehicles driving around. It was this amazing experience. Matter of fact, I was having so much fun that for the first time in my life, I began to reconsider my lifelong anti-drug stance. Because every so often, David offered me a joint. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I do these school shows, and I like to be able to tell the kids how I've never smoked marijuana. And he said, well, you can still tell them that. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I like to honestly be able to say that. He's like, cool, man. Cool. No problem. But the next day he comes to me. He's like, look. He goes, with respect, and I'm not trying, but I'm just, it's Burning Man. You're getting married. This is like your bachelor party. Um, I've been thinking about this all day. You can still honestly be able to tell those kids how you've never smoked marijuana even after you eat this brownie. <laughs> My man Dave. So... <laughs> I ate this big ass brownie and then nothing happened, nothing happened until something happened. <laughs> well, let's back up a little bit. I'm 28 years old. I have never been in the same room as marijuana as far as I know it, much less ingested it. I am undernourished, dehydrated, sleep deprived. You also have to figure Burning Man people probably take their brownie seriously, right? <laughs> So I eat this thing, and the first thing that happens, I suddenly became the wisest human being who's ever lived. <laughs> All the secrets of life revealed themselves to me. I, I understood high school physics. I knew, I knew what music meant. I knew why Kurt Cobain killed himself. I don't even know where that came from. I'm like, oh, of course, yeah. And, um, and it was amazing until it wasn't, because then the corners of my vision started to blur a little bit. And I started to feel just a little wobbly. And I'm like, I, I gotta lie down. And I get to my tent just in time, because as I dive into the tent, I don't know if it made the news or not, but the revolution of the planet began to speed up that day in the <laughs> desert. And the planet begins to spin faster and faster and faster. And I am holding on to the floor of my tent. And I am ripping this with a dead. I swear, every time it would go around, I could feel like my feet start to fall off the planet. And it's going faster and faster and faster. And then I wanted to cry out for help, but I couldn't because I forgot how to work my face. <laughs> My jaws were clenched, my teeth were clenched, my eyes were clenched. Now it's nighttime and bongos start playing next to me, right? So I hear bongos going off and then techno music kicks in. Not long after that, so I got mts, 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 and bongos and laughter and voices and footsteps and I'm spinning and I can't cry out and the voice in my head splits in two and half of it says, dude, it's a brownie. Relax, let go, you'll be fine. And the other half was like, don't you dare let go. If you let go, you're gonna spin off into infinity. <laughs> And we were both right. Because it was just a brownie. And I let go. And I spun off into infinity. And it's so cliche, but it was every... I felt myself leaving my body. And I could look down on the tent, in the desert, on the planet, in the, the solar system. And I'm zipping out into the farthest reaches of the universe. And it's just blackness and darkness and emptiness. And I'm zooming around. And, and I'm realizing, oh, the Kurt Cobain, Cobain thing. He just wanted to embrace nothingness. And, oh, shit, that's what nirvana means. Oh! And, and, and I'm there. And it was amazing until it wasn't because then it got scary right my whole life I had been completely insulated from any fear of death right to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord and I I never feared death ever and then after I became an atheist I, some of my believing friends would be like well, what happens to you when you die I'm a candle I get extinguished 
But that was just something a guy in his early 20s could just throw out there without having really dealt with my own mortality yet. And it's one thing to say, oh, I'm a candle, but when you feel like it's about to be extinguished, it was terrifying. Some of you have had your, oh shit, I'm moral moments, I'm sure. Those of you who haven't, <laughs> it's going to suck. <laughs> but it's the first time I really understood that I was a temporary existence, at least in this form, right? And I, I'm there and I felt I was fighting against it and I felt myself drifting off and I would fight my way back. And I thought when my grandma passed, it was a lot like that, where she would drift and fight back. And, and then eventually peacefulness kind of washed over her face and then she drifted off to death. And I felt that. and the terror at some point slipped to the sense of, you know, I came from nothingness and emptiness and I'm returning to nothingness and emptiness and it is what it is. And I drifted off to sleep. <laughs> the next day I woke up very grateful to be alive, if a little bit melancholy that I wouldn't always be. And that night was the burning of the man and the man, they light on fire and, and their fireworks go off first and there's people dancing around and there's fire breathers and fire spinners and jugglers and the man starts to burn and people are handling it both uh, all different ways. I've got uh, a woman over here and she's jumping up and down going, I love you, I love you so much. And I got dude over here going, burn motherfucker, burn! And I'm somewhere in between, I'm like, ah! And then the man implodes and everybody rushes forward and they're running big circles around it and I find Sean in the midst of all this, and Sean at this point has gone way past brownies. He's got the big eyes. He's like, hey. and we're hanging on to each other, and I start screaming, I'm alive. And he's like, yeah, you're alive. Uh, you're alive. And we're jumping up and down, holding hands, screaming, we're alive. <laughs> eventually, things kind of wind down that night. We go our separate ways, and then eventually we go our separate ways back to life. I go back home. I get married. A year after that, my boy Trey comes along. A year after that, the 9-11 recession takes the legs out from under my speaking business. It's just like a faucet was turned off and money froze everywhere and school budgets got slashed. I'm the first guy to go. Now we're, I always hate when guys do this, we're pregnant. No, my wife was pregnant. So my wife is pregnant with our daughter now and there's no health insurance and no income. Ah, being a grown up is hard. No one told me. And I mislearned some of the lessons at Burning Man. Like I, number one, I realized myself that I wanted to be an artist. I would look at these physical creations of art and think, I wish I could be an artist. And when I came back home, I thought, well, maybe this spoken word thing doesn't just have to be motivational speaking. Maybe I can do monologue or something. And I wrote my first one-man play. And, and I wanted to be then, I confused emptiness and nothingness with meaninglessness because I thought, you know, nothing matters. I, I went all dead poet society. I've got to suck the marrow out of life. And I wanted to be crazy outlaw artist guy and I read too much Hunter Thompson and Charles Bukowski. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to live like that. And I got to be crazy outlaw artist guy. And it was fun and it was exciting and it was selfish and it was stupid. And it wasn't the time in my life when I should have been doing that. I almost burned down a really nice life again. But I had this wife who never gave up on me. And she gave me these two kids that keep me from giving up on myself. And I was able to turn that art kind of against my own demons. And my second one-man show I ever did uh, was me on stage with an actual gun, an actual bullet, and a monologue about whether or not I would end the show by playing an actual game of Russian roulette. And the day before I opened the show, I hadn't decided which way to go at the end. But I kind of felt myself separate from my demons at that point. And I learned that art can be an important process. And it became my process. And I wrote eventually, you know, seven, eight more monologues. But the second monologue after the one with the gun, I didn't know what to do because I felt like I had used up all my crazy with the gun one. So I'm like, all right. Um, and I started uh, taking an Aikido martial arts class. And that led to sitting meditation. And now I'm starting to flirt around with the idea of becoming enlightened. I thought, oh, I'll do a show about enlightenment. No. I will get enlightened and do a show about that. Buddha did it, I could do it, damn it. So I decided to get enlightened. So what I did was, is I went, all right, first I believed one thing. And then I believed nothing. Real hardcore atheist nihilist. And then I thought, well, just for fun, one thing, nothing. Everything. I'll embrace everything. And I read every kind of holy book you could read. And I went and experienced all these things. And I uh, would go to mosques, and I would go to temples, and I would go to churches. And I didn't want to believe any of it. I just wanted to see, instead of how they were all different, look for the commonalities. And where, if you laid them all top of each other, where is the core that you could see goes through them all? And I, I fasted Ramadan, uh, the entire thing, as an atheist, just for fun. And then I would throw that in with Nigerian Buddhism, and I would chant during Ramadan, because why not? And I'm doing, I, I would invite the Jehovah Witnesses to come in and 
and talk and my wife would go, oh, geez. And I remember she was getting so irritated with me that one night I went to tell her something and she rolled over, she was sleeping, she goes, yeah, 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 I know, I know, go get enlightened. Like a clarion call. Go get enlightened. I mean, her tone was, go fuck yourself. But it was, um, it was a mixed message that I took to mean, you have my permission to go back to Burning Man. <laughs> Sweet, so I did. So here's the narrative I'm going to work on. I'm going to go back to Burning Man, right? Because my demon was born there, and he followed me home and tried to kill me. But I killed him with the gun show, and now I'll take him back to Burning Man and bury him. I thought of the 22-year-old me walking along the beach wishing I could die. And I thought, man, that guy would kick my ass for not thinking this life is enough. Because I don't get to be the, the preacher who saves the world. But I get to be my little boy's teacher. And I get to help my little girl find her place in the world. And I never made my Anthony Robbins money as a motivational speaker, but I've found some way to live off the words I speak for the last 17 years. And I decided maybe that would be my message, that I would be a prophet of enoughness, that I would be a born-again enougher. And like the Zen koan where you ask yourself as you sit in meditation, at this moment, what is lacking? And then you hope from the deepest, truest part of you, the real answer is nothing, that this moment is complete. I'm going to go just a minute over because i got to tell you this story. The one of the three that I did meet in the desert that night, the next morning, I'm sorry, I met him. I was sitting outside my tent eating a tasty bowl of Lucky Charms in my Playa costume, which is surgical scrub pants, moccasins, and a fedora. I don't know why, but I like it. And I was sitting there eating my Lucky Charms just as the sun was starting to come up. It's still like a blue-gray, and I see a figure walking towards me. But he's not walking towards me, he's walking to me. And I also see that he is bare-ass naked from head to toe. <laughs> And he comes walking right up to me, and while I'm sitting on the ground, that made for a weird eye contact thing, but I'm like, and he goes, oh, Lucky Charms, can I have some? Okay. And he sits down right next to me and goes, Do you want me to make you a bowl? <laughs> nah, I'm good. <laughs> so I feed him a couple more bites, and then he gets up and walks his naked ass off into the desert. And I realized just a second too late, it was Jesus. <laughs> no, 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 think about it. It's in the Bible, right? I was hungry, and you fed me. I was naked, and you fed me Lucky Charms. All right, it's a little bit different. <laughs> And if he wasn't B Jesus, he was Buddha, right? Because I'm telling you, look, I'm not saying I loved it, but to make me feel relatively at ease to feed a naked man Lucky Charms in the desert, you got to have some serious Buddha shit going on. <laughs> and I wished I would have realized who he was, and I figured I lacked the one thing that I needed as this one who wanted to be a messenger first of God and then of the universe is I lacked the actual message. And I wish I would have called after him and said, I know who you are. And he would have looked back at me, and I would have said, what would you have me to do? And I just know he would have said this. Go to Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> to the Free Thought Festival. And tell them this. I don't know why he wanted me to bounce, but I think he would. <laughs> Your life, right now, at this moment, and at every other moment. It's more than enough. It's magically delicious. <laughs> Thank you, guys.